Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Hoffman and I'm with Valley Metro Communications. I just wanted to say hi, we're gonna get started in a couple minutes. Um, we're gonna see Heather, we're gonna you know, get into this, we're gonna paint and we're gonna have a great time during our lunch hour, doing a lunch and learn. So we're all excited you're with us. We just wanted to make sure that you had your materials with you and that you also have your hair dryer plugged in, ready to go, a cup of water. Um, and we are so excited to have you here today. And a paint container. Hey, Heather, if you're narrating, we can't hear you quite yet. Oh, I was waiting for the introductions first. Oh, we're going to do that in just one second. Just wanted to let everybody get in, Jessica. Sounds good. So it's about 12.02. Again, like I said, I'm Brittany Hoffman with Valley Metro Communications. And we also have with us today our Arts Line Spotlight Artist for Spring 2021, Heather Freitas. Hi, guys. So, Heather, obviously, we love having your art up. It's right behind me. I love wearing my flower crown, just like all of the women that you can see out on Arts Line, um, aka Light Rail. Obviously, you can stop by the Roosevelt Wall at Central and Roosevelt and see the amazing artwork that is up there, including Heather. So we encourage all of you to get out on Arts Line and come enjoy the 55 arts and culture destinations that we have to see and obviously be immersed in our Arts Line art that exists at every station. And right now, Heather's being featured as our spotlight artist. So Heather, why don't you give us a little bit of background on how you got started in art and just what it means to be an Arts Line artist? Yeah, so um, I've been painting since I was a kid. I remember, I think it was like, third grade, me and my best friend had these like little fill in the blank books. And I asked like what we wanted to be. And I put a professional artist and she put a cop. So it's literally been my childhood dream. Um, my parents, I wanted to get a car in high school and I needed a co-signer and they told me they wouldn't co-sign in a vehicle unless they took an art class. So I did, and then my second assignment um, ever in my high school art class, my teacher like gave me a different assignment in comparison to the entire class. And like, I just got like hooked by the challenge. Um, and then I did the thing that no parent wants their children to do, even though they made me co-sign or take an art to get a co-sign in vehicle. And I went to art school, which, you know, <laughs> they're like, um, we don't know if you should do this. Um, but then I always had it in the back of my head. My high school art teacher had always said the only way you're ever going to make it is if you develop a style that's unique to yourself. And I was like, well, that's stupid because how do you do that? You know? Um, but I always had that in the back of my head. So even after graduating art college, I had a few failed attempts and then um, it's always important when you're starting or trying to paint um, and beneficial to yourself as an artist to try and like replicate as much as possible so you can learn like the fundamentals of creating. But the biggest thing as far as propelling a career and identifying your style is to just kind of like paint with emotion. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but like for me, I always was like so like set on like creating something that was like perfect in likeness and the moment that I was like you know what like I don't care like if this is going to look like a human or not like I just want to like paint like how I feel and portray that emotion that's when I developed my style and then now we're here 
like you said, your signature style is freeism. And so obviously a take on your name, but definitely encompasses what you've done to get to this point in your career. Um, so Jessica, if you want to bring up the video, can you tell us a little bit about the first steps? Obviously, we sent out the instructions yesterday for the preliminary steps. If you wanted to do them, obviously you can do them at any time um, after this event. Um, but just the beginning parts that we got to to get to this step, and then you can go ahead and take it away. Yeah, so um, one of my most used tools, which is kind of funny, is actually my water bottle um, and then Mod Podge as well. So Mod Podge should have been on your list as well. Normally what I do is I take, I plan what the composition is going to be and the palette, and then I'll use obviously like recycled materials and then I'll add in other like decorative papers. You can use tissue papers. I think a lot of people get caught up in and I've seen a lot of comments of being like, it's not archival, um, but you don't have to stick to regular, like what is deemed like our archi archival art supplies. Sorry, Picasso is well known for using cardboard. I mean, anything that you can get your hands on can be transformed into art. So um, for the purpose of placing the material on the canvas, it's usually better to have a thinner material. And then what you would do is you would spray the canvas with water um, you would apply the Mod Podge all around the cap, the canvas and onto the sides. You would then lay like a thinner type of paper or material. You would spray that to make it more malleable. And then you would adhere with the Mod Podge, wrapping the paper around the sides. And then I kind of fold the papers like a package with additional Mod Podge. Um, the layers are normally like a daily basis. So I'm always working on multiple paintings at a time. So you would lay all that down. You would let it dry. You could maybe put it out in the sun for, I don't know, like seven, eight hours. It needs to be completely dry. Then I go and I add the paint splatter, which is just watered down paint. Um, and then I let that dry another day. And then that's where we get to where we're at now. Awesome. So we can start the video and you can join us and we'll be taking questions in the chat and obviously afterwards with our Q&A, if you have any further questions, um, go ahead and let us know. So we hope you enjoy painting and Heather, take it away. All right. Awesome. So first thing I want to say is you all should have the same paint palette. If you don't, you can use whatever colors you like. Um, it's not shown here, but this canvas is pre-sprayed. So you'll just mist a little bit of water on top of your canvas. Um, I put the phalo blue on the top and then the violet on the bottom. I just dabbed it on the painting. Um, these paints in particular are not very highly pigmented. So if you want the color to pop a little bit more, you can use just a tad bit of white with the color and mix them together when you apply them. Um, or before you start painting. For the background, um, I wouldn't recommend that because if you add that white, you're not gonna be able to see through your other layers. So once you spray on the canvas and you add your dots, or you're just, just gonna take a brush, you can start from the bottom or the top and just mix down and brush down. You're gonna do this um, as far as blending, as you can see without adding the white with this paint, um, you can see through the background. So if you watch my fluid movements, this is this will be how you mix. Um, if you get done before I'm talking about this, you can go ahead and take your hair dryer to start drying it so we can move on to the next process. Um, I chose these paints because they were a little bit more beginner friendly um, and affordable. I was telling the team that I wish I could have supplied or recommended the paints that I use, but due to COVID, um, there actually has been a very big paint shortage on the paints that I use. So it's been a hurdle that I've had to overcome and one that's caused me a great deal of stress. Like I never would have anticipated paint being out of stock. Um, for those of you interested in what paints I use and what other supplies I use, if you go to my website, which is www.heatherfreitas.com, at the very bottom of my home page, I do have a list um, via Amazon where you can view and shop around like 90% of my supplies. The paint that I normally use is uh, Craft Smart Mixed Media Paint. It's not on the higher end of paint. Again, don't always focus on having like the highest quality art supplies or brands. It's really going to matter what you do and your process and how you create. 
I've really mastered that paint style because it allows, it's a less heavier body of paint where the more professional paints um, are much thicker and heavier bodied, which would mean it would cover up the many layers that are involved in all of my work. Um, so always play and test around with different paints. Once you have dried your background for this, you're gonna go ahead and paint a stem and some leaves. I used for the base of it, the phthalo green, which is what I'm using now. It doesn't need to be exact. Feel free to play and create and paint whatever you like. If you don't want to do um, green leaves, do orange leaves, do yellow leaves, um, whatever you feel like. Again, as you can see, the paint is a little darker. If you want to mix a teeny bit of white in it, then that'll bring the color out a little bit more with these paints. And then next, I think what I'm doing <laughs> is using the light green. You can use a paint palette. You can use paper next to you, um, anything to put a little bit of paint on the side. Fun fact, with the paints that I do use, I 95% of the time don't ever mix my own paints. I just slab them on and layer them together. Again, breaking the rules and traditions, um, I think that's something that's great about art is you can just do whatever you want and that's art itself. I don't ever try and create something to look like super realistic. I'm more interested in the movement and the brush strokes that are seen and the process in itself as I believe that yields more emotion within it. Um, and I never really get too caught up in trying to make it look realistic at all really, I guess, um, just to be able to portray what it is. So don't worry if you're not getting things to look exact. Um, I've always said if people wanted to buy something that was completely realistic, they would buy a photograph. So just have fun and be fluid. I'm adding in a little bit of the light green and a little bit of the yellow to the leaves to just add a little bit of depth. You can add a little bit coming out the corners, um, whatever you feel creates a fun movement and composition for you. I'm then again going to take that green and I'm going to put a circle in the center. When you notice and look at sunflowers, the center is brown or green, um, orange. You can use those colors, um, but with the palette that we have, I recommend using the same color, similar color to the leaves to draw the color palette up and create a balance. Um, and we'll be adding a little bit more shading around it. Um, with that, I chose the violet. Again, you can use whatever colors you like. Like I said, I never really mix mine. And for the most part, I never really use colors true to the object itself which I create, think, think, sorry, creates a little bit more visual interest. If you notice around the green um, and in the center of where the purple is, I left a little bit of the blue showing through so you can see a little bit, but I'm gonna go in and just add a little bit of the crimson. When you're doing this, you wanna make sure that you're not like slabbing a ton of paint on or it's gonna be really hard to dry. I'm taking that crimson and creating a depth layer um, with that for the background. So this will just kind of be like the outline of your flower. Um, it's not gonna be the actual colors of the leaves. It's just for the leaves that are like behind. So um, you can draw them in the shape of actual petals. In this case, I'm just kind of lining them on. Again, that movement that I think yields greatly to art in general. You can go ahead if you want to um, and dry that really quick. And then I believe the next color I'm going to be using is primary red, or you can do the cadmium orange and mix. I'm using the cadmium orange, sorry, um, and mix a little bit of white if you want it brighter than what I have here. With that, I'm going in and I'm outlining a little bit more and adding a little bit more shading. Don't worry about everything being so defined right now. Whenever I do, this is what I consider an underlayer of my painting. I just kind of throw paint on 
Um, I never pre-trace anything. I just kind of let it go and have fun with it. Um, and then once it's dry after these stages, we'll go in and we'll outline the piece, which will create more of the feeling and depth of what it is, which is why you don't want to just slab a ton of paint on. Now I got the yellow. <laughs> so go ahead and dry again. Hair dryer is like your best friend. I know we're working class too. I believe they're gonna be sending this out again if you guys need to redo any steps, if you wanna just kind of look at the process and create something different um, from it. So don't worry about it. Um, if you can keep moving at this pace and just see what happens and see what movement comes from it, I'm pretty sure you'll be very surprised and pleased with it. So I'm going in adding a little bit of depth with the yellow. If you want to, too, once I have my overall draft or what I consider this being done, sometimes I'll let it dry a day and I'll go in and add more mixed media materials on top of it and then go in and paint over that a little bit more so you can create tons of different layers. I always tell artists to do it's always great to go and explore as many different supplies sorry, and brands to see what works best for you and your technique and how you paint. Um, everybody kind of gets in the notion that just paint, all paint is not created equal and all paint is able to artists. Paint is great for some artists. They are incredibly hard for me to get my style with. So we skipped ahead a little bit. What I'm doing is I'm taking my um, Neon Moonlight gel pens. I love these things. Um, they were a childhood favorite and I just started kind of incorporating some of those supplies into my work as of late because they remind me of childhood and who doesn't wanna go back then. Um, and I'm just drawing some stars. You can also use the different color gel pens that you have to kind of outline and draw So as with all of our lovely technology, we are uh, getting a little bit glitchiness from Heather. So Heather, can we ask you, Heather, can we just ask you to turn off your video right now and see if we can continue with the audio? I'm sorry, turn off what? Just turn off your video. So that way it's just the audio coming through. Oh, I see. Okay. Can you hear me? We are good now. Okay. Anyway, sorry about that. If you notice, um, or if you have, which you probably will have some little like blobs of paint, you can just take your finger and smooth them out to dry faster. You're then going to take your ink pen that was recommended and you're just going to like outline the flower how you would like. Um, if you follow me or have followed me on Instagram, you'll see my process videos of the full process and paintings I use with my paint. They're highly sped up, so it may look like I'm only using one of these pens. I had recommended my favorite pen to use for all of you guys to explore with, but in many cases, most of my paintings involve anywhere from six to 12 different pens, depending on the tip and the size of the painting or um, what the subject of the painting is. This brand is one of my favorites. They have tons of different um, tips and heads for different width, like line width or for like the stippling that I do with the pens themselves. Um, I highly recommend this brand. So if you ever want to go ahead and purchase them, um, it's I believe it's Faber Castle. Um, they're absolutely great. There's another one that I use, and it is Pigma Graphic. 
Um, and those have different style tips as well for creating different line widths and shading. So this is what I was talking about before with the gel pens. Um, I decided to use the orange and the pink to create the little circles within the sunflower. I love these pens so much. Um, sometimes if they clog, I'll end up just taking the ink out and dipping it into my, or putting it in a little separate area of the palette. And then I will add dots with it as well. Um, it's just a really fun tool to use to create like really vibrant, fun work. Um, I really wanted to use them since this painting was darker in general, just to create like more of a nighttime glow effect. Um, and I found that fun and interesting because sunflowers are normally only open during the day. Um, so I chose to do the sunflower at night kind of as symbolism of finding light in the darkness. So I'm just adding little squiggles to define the flower petals. Um, you can add them in wherever you like. I will end up adding them into the leaf petals as well. And then that's the yellow. Just so bright and fun. You don't have to do zigzags. You can do little swirls. Um, you can even use them to create dots. And this painting, just because it's a lunch hour class, normally I also add, um, fun fact, I always only add three different additional colored dots in my painting on top of black and white. Um, because of the duration of this video, we'll only be doing the black dots and the white dots, but you can always add as many dots as you want um, and play with it from there. Adding colored dots is known as pointillism, where shading with pen or ink is known as stippling. So I've combined that process in my style as well, or both of those, as well as other processes. You can go ahead and add little dots around the stars as well. Or clouds. I've been on a really big cloud kick lately. I don't know if you guys have noticed if you follow me. I just love them. They're so whimsical. So I'm outlining the leaves as well. I'm just using yellow, but normally I would use yellow and green, sometimes pink within the line work. If you guys ever do create any artwork in this style, um, Brittany did mention, I just started creating a name for it as it's starting to get taught in some classrooms around the United States and other artists taking inspiration from or trying to develop the style further. Um, so the name I created for it is Sprayism. So if you ever do when you share it, go ahead and tag that and maybe I'll share your work. When you're done with the line work, normally the gel pens will dry themselves really fast, um, but you can go ahead and take the blow dryer over it to make sure that it's completely dry. I'm not seeing the video anymore. I'm just going to get the next part up. If we want to take a quick break while people oh. catch up and maybe ask a couple questions, I will get it going. Okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Heather? You can either type them in the chat or just raise your hand. Heather, can you explain? Um, and while the video is off, you could probably turn your video back on. Um, but can you explain what it was like um, creating the mural for the Roosevelt wall? Because obviously you didn't create a giant mural and go paint it out there yourself. Uh, we use vinyl panels to get that work done. But what was that like creating something in a smaller form to then be blown up so big? 
Yeah, so I had done that previously for the Cambria project, so I was pretty familiar with it. Um, I've gotten asked and reached out to multiple times lately to create like actual painted murals in the Valley and a couple other states and with my media, obviously, I'm not sure that would hold up having newspaper on a wall. So um, it's something that I really love doing because it allows for me to still be able to display my style and the layers um, correctly. Um, and I just think it's so cool when it's like blown up and then like people can actually like see the text when they walk up. That's been one of my biggest challenges with um, selling on Instagram and Facebook is like just having like this tiny picture of something that could be big or small and people not being able to see like all the layers. So creating this project was really fun to be able to allow people to like really see the depth and the layers on a large scale, regardless of the original size. Awesome, Jessica's ready with the video. And take it away, Heather. All right, so I believe what we're gonna start doing is the dots with the ink pen. Again, make sure that everything is dry. So if you wanna take a hot pass over with your hair dryer, um, that will help with any smudging or smearing. Oh, we're gonna do the white dots. So um, I may have skipped the black dots in this video as well. Um, again, when it comes to using art supplies, you can use anything that you want. These are actually nail tools um, that I found really worked with creating dots. Um, I normally put just like a little bit of paint in there and then I'll dip the whole head and as you're putting the dots kind of rotate the tool and that'll give you an even amount of paint. Um, while we're doing white, I chose to demonstrate white for this because highlighting is very important in creating depth in artwork. So anywhere that you want to appear like raised off is where you're gonna add the dots. So um, in the center, I did it and then around, I highlighted the leaf petals a little bit with white dots. And then I'm going to go in the center of all of the petals and I'm going to add dots in as well. Um, again, normally I do black with my ink pens, white paint, and then three other color paints in all of my pieces as far as dots and shading. Um, if you want to do five or six or seven, or when we're done with this video, you want to add more color dots, feel free to do so. Again, if you want them to be Brighter, you can take just a little bit of white paint and mix it with any of those pigments in the palette we provided, and it should create a more vibrant lift to the paint that you're using for adding the dots in. You can also use these kind of as a tool to draw with and create circles with. Um, it takes a little bit to get used to as far as rotating it while you're dotting, but for me, it's really the most valuable tool that I found to create even dots. Painting dots with a paintbrush just goes a lot slower. They're not as even. And I just really like the feel and control that I can get with these. I'm sure there's tons of other art supplies out there as well for you guys to browse and play with to create different techniques and different processes and different ways of creating movement. Um, I'm always trying and adding in new supplies and playing with them. The sky is the limit and it's so much fun. When you're done with the white, go ahead and take your hair dryer and make sure to dry all of the white dots. And then you're gonna sign your painting. You can sign it with the pen. You can sign it with one of the gel pens that may be easier. I've used these nail tools for years now. So I sign with that at times, but that can be a little trickier and messier for people. Um, when you're done, normally I will take my black pen and I will outline just the sides. I'll put it on an angle and outline it to create a black line around it. And then I'll go and I'll take black paint to paint the sides of the canvas. Once you're done doing that, you will let it dry for a day. And then I use a water-based polyurethane um, to seal my paintings. 
Sometimes I use multiple varnishes to seal paintings, but I was telling Brittany a, lot, a few years ago, like I had a friend who asked and I was like, oh yeah, like we'll seal your painting with this polyurethane. And we went to put it on her painting and because of the media she used, it smeared her entire piece. So <laughs> I don't want that to happen to you guys. So for anybody that's a beginner or not familiar with the varnishes, the best way to varnish your painting is to use a standard spray varnish. Normally I recommend the gloss because it's easier for care. Um, so definitely do that if you're scared of ruining your piece or if you want to play with different varnishes, you can always use test pieces and play. There's like probably thousands of different varnishes out there. Um, I don't have the, I believe actually I use Krylon crystal clear varnish. Um, I'm not really picky as long as it says gloss and varnish on it. <laughs> Um, and sometimes I'll go and I will take paintings that have like multiple medias that are more delicate and I'll spray over painting let that dry a day and then polyurethane polyurethane. Um really big and trending right now is resin. I particularly am not a fan of resin because whenever I've shown my work in person, people want to come up and like touch the layers on it and I feel like resin kind of takes away from that experience but again like it's really great to play and experiment also not shown in this video and something else that I use that's not really notable as far as painting is I embroider on my work so I will get embroidery floss and a needle and just kind of sew in texture where I want so when you're creating and if you took anything from this class, I really hope it inspires you to play with media, even if it's not deemed a painting media, because that is really what will help you create unique work and help you develop a style of your own. I hope you guys had a lot of fun. And if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, you can raise your hand in um, at the very bottom of the screen. You should see there's what looks like a smiley emoji. And it says reactions and you can go ahead and raise your hand. You can also give her claps. Um, we know some of you who have logged in through the phone may not have the chat function. So feel free. Thanks, Athena. Um, so exciting. And as Heather said before, we want to see your work. So even if it's not finished right now, we obviously know that art takes time. So uh, tag arts line, tag Valley Metro, tag Heather um, and everyone who's on the uh, call today uh, for our lunch and learn. We are going to send you a follow up email so that you can get your tote bag and it looks like this. Oh, it's not coming through. Oh, does it like me? Oh, okay. Well, I'll send you a picture, <laughs> but I also send you the email so that you can send us your address. Um, so, and we'll also give you a, a link to Heather's website. So you can go check out the store that she has through Amazon so that you can find all of those cool, um, you know, different art pieces and projects and what she has to you. So obviously keep doing art. We don't want you to stop. This was not just a one time thing. Athena, there will be a link and I will send that out uh, probably out by Monday. So keep experimenting. But yes, you guys will have a special link to access this um, before everyone else, obviously, because you came to our event and we loved having you here. Um, some other things about Artsline just to get excited about. Um, we will have our upcoming call for artists for 2022 coming this summer. So if you're working on your art or if you know anyone else who's an artist, Heather went through the process. So Heather, what can you tell us about being an art sign artist and what that process was to get to where you are? Um, it was really a blast. I was really excited for you guys allowing me to create the women and creating a powerful public art project. Um, obviously, I reach a lot of people on social media, but public art, I think, is just absolutely amazing because it's in people's faces if they choose for it or not. Um, and working on designing pieces to work in a way to be placed in certain areas was really fun. Um, and I really enjoyed being able to work with you guys and create such a powerful statement about women and the places that I hope we will continue to go and how we have advanced moving forward.
And the submission process for becoming on a call or uh, becoming the spotlight artist, was that difficult? I have everything like kind of, it, no, it was not. It was very simple um, and compounded. I su suggest or would, well, I don't know what the word is for it. <laughs> it's been a long day. Encourage everybody to apply. And even if you don't get it, continue applying. Um, when I first started like years ago, I would apply and get like all these rejection letters. And then I realized that if I didn't apply, I would never get a project in the first place. So I read something a long time ago and it said that if you apply to a hundred and you get 99 refusals, but you get one approval, then it's worth it. So I encourage all of you guys to apply. It's a very simple process. And even if you were not to get to be selected, actually I did apply. This was my second application. And the first time I got refused and this is my second time and I got accepted. So don't ever give up and keep pushing. Yeah, so like you said, you know, keep at it. Art is definitely one of those things that's subjective to people. And, you know, you may find that, you know, you're getting rejections from one place, but some place is just ready to embrace everything you're doing. Um, so I have a couple more questions for Heather, but please feel free, raise those hands, uh, type them in the chat if you can. Um, Heather, obviously I have lots of flowers behind me designed by you. Yeah. Um, where did you get the inspiration for flowers and fauna and did they have any special meaning to you? So um, I graduated with a bachelor's in fine arts, but I took a lot of art history classes for electives and I've always just really been drawn to symbolism and I really loved the incorporation of symbolism throughout history and art. Um, flowers and butterflies in particular have been like kind of my common motives as of late, um, just because I mean, it actually all started with the sunflower and how that sunflower like follows the light um, and the meanings within flowers. And there's something that's beautiful, but also carries so much meaning. So I really wanted to incorporate the flowers as symbolic with the women as a headdress and as a crown. Um, they're also a symbol of like females. So it was just really important for me to tie um, aspects of symbology within the piece that was not only beautiful, colorful, and eye capturing, but that had multiple layers of symbolism within all of it. Well, and I definitely want to say a big thank you from Valley Metro because obviously, after the year we had in 2020, getting this bright, vibrant, uplifting artwork to start out the spring, and we actually launched it on the International Day of the Women. So it was exciting. Yeah to you know highlight these women and obviously all of their achievements and you too for your achievements but um like you said bringing those all together symbolizing what women have done and created and continue to do um in this world so it's very amazing um where else do you find inspiration heather my life <laughs> i think all artists do um i've been sick forever, like since I can remember. So instead of looking at it as something that was dark, I kind of turned to art to help distract me from it. Um, and with that, instead of like allowing me being sick and the things that I've gone through in my life um, that are uncontrollable because I haven't been able to control my body, However, I just finally got diagnosed with the correct diagnosis for the first time in 25 years. So I'm starting to get a lot better, which is absolutely amazing. That turmoil really allowed me to focus on my art and put the time aside to build my art as a career, but it also helped heal me. Um, that's why if you see a lot of my work, it's like colorful and happy. There's a lot of humor and sarcasm in it because I'm a firm believer that like humor heals everything. Um, so I tried to turn my struggles into something to heal people, not only people that were like struggling and sick, but people who were dealing with emotional issues or even just having a bad day or inspiring people to know that 
even if they were super, super sick, that they can still be a professional artist, um, that you can turn things that are negative into and spin them into something or paint them into something beautiful and a message that everybody can take to kind of create a hopeful ripple effect and help bring more positivity and inspiration and healing to this world. Yeah, so beautifully said, Heather. And one of the things that I personally even was wondering was during when you're creating each of these pieces, obviously you have said some of them have humor to them, some of them are more inspiring. When you're layering those back layers of the, you know, tissue paper and different articles and newspaper, you said that you obviously lay all that out first to make sure that it's what you're envisioning. Are there ever secret like hidden messages or meanings behind any of those that go in there? Um, sometimes, yes. Uh, for example, my my brother actually commissioned a painting for me and he really likes food. So I decided to find like some little funny food cartoons and articles and like words and I even like little food he does like in our house. <laughs> um, but for like this series for Valley Metro as well, um, I tried to select some areas that would show through that had connection and meaning. Um, I do correlate like colors as far as like for underneath and patterns for underneath when I'm using the decorative paper. For the newspaper, I try and incorporate words in certain areas, but then other areas will be covered up. So sometimes it's kind of fun for myself, even when I add like the newspaper or text, because I'll anticipate like one thing showing through, but then I get carried away as painting and I don't really pay attention and something else will pop through and it kind of has more significance and weight as far as meaning within it, which is fun. Yeah, I definitely noticed on the Roosevelt wall, there is a clip of from the Arizona Republic of things to do this weekend. And I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, take arts line. That's a thing to do this weekend. So it was <laughs> yeah. like the perfect little hidden message in there that we obviously want everyone to go out and explore the line and, you know, see all of your artwork that exists throughout the trains and at the different stations. So um, again, we are welcoming and accepting any questions. So if you have any, type them in the chat, raise your hand. We're more than happy to take them. Heather, can you tell us about future projects and things you're looking forward to? I have a podcast coming up, but I'm not allowed to say with who, but that will be released soon. Um, I do have some tentative partnerships with some pretty well-known plus size models as I'm working on developing collections and series, documenting women that are plus size um as a means to showcase their beauty as it's not really seen too much which is weird because a lot of us are plus size <laughs> um so i'm planning on partnering with and i have a couple of plus size models that i'll be collaborating with on projects in the future um i'm starting to branch out not only into paintings but i'm also creating like clay and painted pendant lights um, and i'm working on getting more public art projects I'm also working on getting a wiki page up and the name of my style in Urban Dictionary and possibly connecting with a lawyer to further investigate getting a patent on my style as well. So that's really exciting. I never thought I'd get to this place um, as well as talking and networking with teachers who are starting to teach my style in their classrooms as well. So you have a lot coming up in the next yeah. <laughs> year, years to come. Um, but like you said, you've done the Cambria project um, in downtown Phoenix. We obviously encourage everyone to go out to the Roosevelt and Central Wall where you can see Heather's mural. But where are some other places throughout the valley that people can go to see your different styles of artwork? Um, Tempe, so Mill Avenue, um, I have the She Tempe project. Um, I believe there's like five, four or five newspaper stands with my artwork down there, right on Mill Avenue, if you can find them all. And then I also have one in Chandler by downtown Chandler. I can't remember the cross streets of it. That is on my website though. So if you go to my website, I have a section on there that lists all of my public art projects. And if any of the paintings are allowed to be released to the public, 
um, and are available. I have like a shop on there as well. And so the Chandler one, it will show the cross streets on that. And then I also have one in Colorado as we speak. Awesome. So we did get a question from Helen and she wanted to know how you chose the women to highlight for your Valley Metro series. I wanted, I just was so serendipitous that it was going to be released during International Women's Day, but I like to speak about and inspire people. And I think that women have so much to offer and I'm not sure if a lot of people know it, but even today, like even in the art industry, it's still dominated by men in 2021, which is insane. Like they literally will have like gallery showing calls will be like, we're doing this as a special to women only. And it's like, that should not even be a thing, you know? So um, that's another like layer within meanings of it all. So pieces and parts of my life and things that I've dealt with, with being a female artist um, and just the things that we're all capable of. And I really wanted to inspire women while they were like going about their day or while they were like riding the transit to whatever job they're doing to get their dream, really fully believe that whatever you love to do the most, you're going to excel in and imagine a world where everybody did what they loved. If it's good, we'll put that out there, <laughs> but I just think it would be like a much more beautiful society. And I really believe in the power that women have. And I really wanted to emphasize that with my work. Yeah, I know when I got sent the list of all the women, there were obviously, you know, certain people that I knew Rosa Parks is on there. Um, RBG, we had Sandra Day O'Connor. So a, a lot of names that we already knew, but then she also, you know, highlighted different women that I didn't know about before. So it was incredible to see this collection of women and they are obviously placed everywhere throughout the train and then on Roosevelt Central wall. So, I mean, you're getting a little taste of different women as you travel throughout the system. So like Heather said, you never know who you're going to, you know, have that impact on. And so having these different women throughout the transit system has just been incredible and we appreciate it. So Heather, is there anything else you want to tell people? Um, maybe an inspiring moment for you right now? Um, just to not give up. Like I said, like I had three failed attempts at becoming a professional artist and it took me, I want to say 12 years to develop my style. That's not going to be the same for everybody. Somebody may develop it in a year. Um, but also if you're planning on making art a career, the biggest falsehoods that I see that are like kind of stemmed within the art community is the starving artist idea. That's actually completely false. If you look at like the federal census for jobs, fine art painters, the average income for a salary is 54,000 a year. So that's people that run businesses as a fine artist and that's their average income. Another is that art will sell itself. Art does not sell itself. You have to sell your art. So marketing is extremely important. Um, when I was first starting out, I was like, I need to be in galleries. Like I have to do things like the way that they're supposed to be done. And that didn't work for me, just as it is with creating your style, how you're going to market your artwork is going to be trial and error, and it's going to be reflective of you and your work and trying to figure out what works best for you. But don't ever stick to the rules like. Hardly anybody ever gets anywhere sticking by the rules, like do things your way. You don't have to stick to art supplies for art supplies like. You don't have to run your art business like you're told you have to run an art business. Like you don't have to be in a gallery or you can be in a gallery. Like galleries are great too, but we're all different. And as long as you don't give up and you have that passion and that inspiration and you keep trying and you keep manipulating your tactics, like you will succeed. Thank you, Heather. So important. Like you said, just never giving up and keeping going for your dreams and you know, eventually things will happen when they're supposed to happen. So again, we want to thank everyone for joining us. This is our first lunch and learn. So obviously you hopefully you learned a lot. We had a great time being here with you again. We will be sending out the recording so that you guys have a clip of, you know, a snippet of what we did today. Um, so you can keep trying out Heather's techniques and, you know, create your own art again, if you want to post, please tag uh, Valley Metro, tag Heather, 
hashtag arts line. And we always encourage you to hell to to go to our arts line page um, at valleymetro.org slash arts line. We always have upcoming events that are actually starting again soon. So that's an exciting thing to get back to that, you know, more normal status where we can be together. Um, but we enjoyed having you here today. Um, watch out for that email so that you can get your tote bag. And if there's any last minute questions, I'll take them. But otherwise, guys, have a great day. We enjoyed having you with us. You have a couple minutes before maybe a next meeting or something. Um, but thank you. We really appreciate all of you today coming and we hope to see you again soon. I hope you guys had a lot of fun and don't ever give up and keep experimenting. <laughs>